reggae. It's all good fun until the voices in your head tell you to burn your studio down. This is The Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about Lee Scratch Perry. Record producers are often seen at their highest elevation as actual supernumerary members of bands, such was the regard in which George Martin or Gus Dudgeon were held, or as shadowy figures working dark arts to supplement or diminish a performer's creative personality. Martin Hannett or Phil Spector spring to mind, or at their worst a corporate quality and image control committee, the kind of production by focus group that Beyonce and her ilk tend to favour, or, in rare cases, artists possessing a special kind of crazy whose records, for better or for worse, are reflections of their own peculiar madness, Brian Wilson or Kanye West. And this edition's subject is from the last mentioned of these categories, a man who was the defining voice of Jamaican music, the mad professor himself, Lee Scratch Perry. From humble beginnings in the tiny hamlet of Kendall, Rainford Hugh Perry, son of an Etu queen and a keeper of the Yoruba spiritual traditions, and a father whom he came to hate and disown, left home with a fourth grade education seeking a way to avoid the life of backbreaking labour and indescribable poverty that was the lot of his family. He spent his time wandering Hanover, Manchester and Clarendon parishes, listening to nature which he claims taught him more about music than anything, and picking up money here and there hustling dominoes or winning shillings in dance contests in one of the tiny dance halls in the myriad villages dotted across the countryside. His primary concern seemed to be getting nice clothes, a bicycle and avoiding work. By the end of the 1950s his idyll ended when he travelled 80 miles west to Negril to drive bulldozers on the construction site of a new tourist resort. It was there in his TD9, shifting boulders and listening to their crash and clang that Perry was seized with the inspiration to become a singer and make the journey to Kingston. The boulders put Perry into mind a king's stone. Then Perry endured a hard scrabble existence, sleeping on the floor with distant relatives and eating a meal a day and sometimes less. He later slept on the floor of a tailor shop in the notorious back of wall slums. But his dance prowess got him noticed around the halls and lawns. A lawn was any place where an open air dance was held, and he soon became a target for the owners of the big sound system to attend exclusively their dances. Okay, brief, and we must keep this brief, diversion to talk about the sound system. The dominant musical entertainment for Kingstonians from the mid-1940s right up to now, the sound system was a mobile disco, featuring rock concert levels of amplification projected from wardrobe-sized speakers called Houses of Joy. The three dominant sound systems in the late 1950s were Duke Reed's Trojan, where Perry first started work but was later summarily exist courtesy of being knocked out by Duke Reed after an argument questioning the ownership of some lyrics, Coxone Dodd's downbeat system where Perry subsequently went to work replacing the great Prince Buster in a variety of roles and Prince Buster's own voice of the people. The sound system consisted of the DJ who spun the records and performed his routine and patter which was called chatting, the selector who read the crowd and picked the records to get them or keep them moving, and later the toaster who usually read satirical or scatological pieces to the beat. The sound system emigrated to wherever Jamaicans dispersed, one ending up in the South Bronx, New York, under the command of a chap called DJ Cool Herc or Clive Campbell to his mum, spinning James Brown and Ohio players discs along with his toaster, now renamed an MC, Coke La Rock. The sound system was ground zero for the most dominant popular music form ever and the greatest offspring of Jamaican music, hip hop. Violence was commonplace at the sound system as gangs affiliated with their respective rival systems known as dance crashes attempted to break up parties. 
Curiously, despite the violence they authorise their thugs to employ against one another, Duke Reed and Coxone Dodd were always on friendly terms personally. But as the gangs, infiltrated by local gangsters or rude boys, became aligned with Jamaica's notoriously corrupt political parties, the sound systems lost control of them and an ongoing anarchy broke out. Following the departure of Prince Buster from Dodd's squad in 1958, Perry rose rapidly through Dodd's ranks with his keen ear and obvious ambition as a selector, talent scout, he discovered Toots and the Maytals, uncredited songwriter, arranger, and even though a limited singer, performer. In 1961, Perry recorded a rudimentary dance tune, Chicken Scratch, with an early version of the soon-to-be legendary Scartalites. Although never issued on vinyl, it remained a sound system favourite for four years and earned Perry his not entirely affectionate nickname. The first record issued under his own name was a fairly straightforward ska tune, Bad Minded People, which is far from unenjoyable but equally nothing extraordinary and was not a success. Perry released regularly through 1963 to 1965, becoming increasingly popular because of the strong country twang in his voice and his humorous songs. His standouts for the period included Please Don't Go, the first example of Perry's ability to blend rhythms, and while self-evidently a ska record, it has a hint of a reggae beat to it. Taku is great stuff, showcasing Perry's upcountry accent. Run Rudy's Run features some bizarre guitar playing while making no sense musically. It just seems to fit the record sonically and atmospherically, which was another harbinger of Scratch's future. In early 1966, however, came a parting of the ways, Perry leaving for much the same reason his great friend Prince Buster had. Cox and Dodd simply didn't pay his artists what they were worth or credit them for the work they were actually doing. Perry was making a flat £10 a side and he thought he could do better. Also, he wanted to be recognised for the production and arranging work he was doing, especially with bands like The Wailers, which was being credited to Cox and Dodd. So shortly after recording the excellent Pussy Galore with the Wailers on backing vocals, Perry decamped for Joe Gibbs' Amalgamated Records, located on Beetson Street, just around the corner of the tailor shop on whose floor Perry once had slept, where he lived out as an independent producer, singing less but finally having the chance to apply his fecund mind and bountiful ideas. Almost immediately, Perry released one of the best diss tracks ever, Run For Cover, which was aimed squarely at Dodd. The record has more than sheer notoriety going for it as it points strongly to reggae at least two years before that music had its name. In 1967, he made a memorable cameo on Prince Buster's all-time classic Judge Dredd, voicing the miscreants James, Zacky Pond and George, who received some righteous justice from the judge. Perry had, by this time, set up his own label, Upsetter, in early 1968, Perry tells the tale of how he was walking outside a Pokemon temple. Uh, Pokemon is a Christian revivalist sect in Jamaica. Perry's one-time protege, Toots Hibbert, was a member. When he heard the Pokemonian wailing and singing and began to set it to a new rhythm in his head. Using this, Perry released his masterpiece to date, I Am The Upsetter, and reggae pretty much became a thing at that point. Of course, Perry immediately quarrelled with Joe Gibb, who, while paying Perry on far more generous terms, wanted a silent partner in Amalgamated, and Perry wanted to be anything but silent. So, Perry was out of his studio. But not without another great diss track in People Funny Boy, which included one of the earliest samples, a recording of a crying baby looped and tempo stretched to fit the rhythm. And what a rhythm it is, simultaneously a reggae record and something beyond reggae, something more mysterious, urgent and disruptive. Perry began freelancing, recording peripatetically, producing over five years an inordinate volume of incredibly high quality and revolutionary music, never throwing away an idea and hitting the mark unerringly, producing hits for anyone who would hire him and continuing his own remarkable string of records. You Crummy, The Mighty Return of Django, Clint Eastwood, a track that sounds like it could have come from 1976, or the bizarre Cipriano. Better known to the casual fan might be the sides he cut with Bob Marley and the Wailers. Perry worked on two albums, Soul Revel and Soul Revolution, from 1970. 
the two albums that featured some well-known songs which Marley was later to re-record. Duffy Conqueror, Sun is Shining, Kaya, as well as the singles Mr. Brown, Peter Tosh's Down Presser Man, and Small Axe. Like many people he worked with, Perry maintained a complex relationship with Marley through the years. Although Ziggy Marley maintained his father felt that Perry was the only man who really understood his music. The same cannot be said for Perry's relationship with fellow whaler Bunny Livingston. The two hated each other since they first met in the 1960s and by all accounts still do today. In 1971, Perry had started to move beyond reggae into both what was called versioning and its natural outgrowth, dub. A quick diversion to explain terms. Versioning, put simply, is a remixing process where certain elements, usually vocal lines, are removed from the mix and instrumental passages are reordered or re-recorded, resulting in long, loopable dance tracks. This was done initially for the sound systems so that the toaster could have space to play his raps over and the popular records then could be played night after night and always be a little bit different, which was a big audience pleaser. Dub is either the logical or the highly illogical evolution of versioning, where both the instrumental and vocal traps are heavily altered in the remix by editing, addition of sound effects and liberal use of reverb and delay and bass channels, which are brought way up in the mix. By 1972, the cream of the next generation of Jamaican stars were working with Perry. The tragic Junior Biles, who cut the tune for Rasta No Pickpocket, Dr. Ali Mantado, whose 1978 Best Dressed Chicken in Town album remains a dub classic, the hilarious toaster Dennis Al Capone, Big Youth, Chenley Doofus, Max Romeo, the Ethiopians, and King Medius with whom Perry made one of his greatest ever productions, the haunting This World, in which he mixes diaphanous threads of melody against a deep, supple bass and an insistent, skanking guitar. But Perry was experiencing difficulties getting studio time, due to a combination of the huge workload he was taking on and the bridges he'd burned with studio owners all across Kingston. So he came up with his own Perry-esque solution. He began building, in his own backyard, his very own studio, the Black Ark, and from it, over the next five years, came forth equal measures of madness and greatness, the like of which has probably never been equaled by any one man. Gearheads may be horrified, but to say that the Black Ark's equipment was rudimentary was an understatement. A TAC 4-track recording machine, a Soundcraft 16-channel mixing desk that he bought for £35, no monitors, a Mutron biphase envelope filter, a Roland Space Echo and a Fisher Dynamic Space Expander Spring Reverb. And it's from this and what Perry himself describes as the stars and the fishes from which he bottled lightning. Before the Black Ark set sail, however, Perry scored with the heavy, heavy sample laden Justice to the People, and from heavy to demented on Jungle Lion, where he teleports the awesome Bojambo of James Brown down to Channel 1 on Maxfield Street and reggae-fies it with jaw-dropping results. Even synths make an appearance on Women and Money by Denzel Dennis, a scorching rocker's cut, which was one of the first tracks Lee recorded in part in the UK. Things got plainly weird on End of the Dragon and topical on public gesturing, while ostensibly a skit between Perry and Winston Blake is actually a pointed comment on the tough new Andy gun laws passed in Jamaica. The B-side of that record, Darkness in the City, is a bleak, skeletal and grim account of Kingston after dark. Murder, rape and depredation are all around. In the arc, 1975-76 saw Perry reach his peak, but saw also the incipient madness start to take over. While he helmed essential productions such as Max Romeo's War in a Babylon and Chase the Devil, Brent Dow's Mournful Down Here in Babylon, Sufferer's Time by the Heptones, Police and Thieves by Junior Mervyn, Devon Irons' Catch a Vampire, and his own excellent Yaga Yaga and Roast Fish and Cornbread, while also working again with Bob Marley on the dub for Smile Jamaica. Roots reggae, such as Romeo Downs recorded, was emerging as a backlash to the Bob Marleyfication of the form. Marley and his British label reducing the music to boilerplate rhythms for American college dorm pot smokers. But Perry was starting to crack under the veneer of this success. 
Overworked and certainly overdrugged, his drinking had reached huge proportions and some helpful soul had introduced him to PCP, with which he laced his baseball bat-sized spliffs with. He lapsed into a dark paranoia, convinced his methods were being stolen by rival producers. 1976 was Dub's greatest year. At least five of the defining albums of a singles-driven genre came out that year. Augustus Pablo's King Tubby Meets Rockers Uptown, Bunny Whaler's Black Heart Man, Max Romeo's War in a Babylon, Burning Spears' Garvey's Ghost, and Perry's masterful Super Ape. Super Ape is a collection of radical remixes or versions of former hits and some obscurities that come as a seamless whole. But his greatest art was being achieved in a Jamaica which was falling apart at the seams as gross economic mismanagement by the People's National Party over their last term, as well as outrageous pre-poll violence for the 1976 elections, saw the country descending into anarchy. Gunmen even tried to murder Bob Marley at his Hope Road house, and the pressure was on Perry to take a side. This pressure, the bad drugs, including the flood of cheap cocaine that had come into the country from Colombia after the government's 1974 CIA back crackdown on the ganja growers, plus harassment by gangsters, which led him to ripping off artists to make payments, saw Lee progressively go to pieces over 1976 to 79. Apart from the glorious Vibrate On with Augustus Pablo, Congo Man with the Congos, and work on the best single The Clash had ever released, 1977 saw the start of a general decline. Occasional brilliant records were still coming out, but Scratch had now taken to bizarre methods to infuse what he felt was nature's juju on those records. Blowing ganja smoke into microphones, burying tapes in his yard for weeks on end to allow the tapes to pick up dirt and moisture and to degrade randomly, as well as worrying personal behaviour. He once spent an extended period walking backwards, speaking gibberish and striking the ground with a hammer, looking for the king's stone perhaps. He took weeks with a small magic marker writing nonsense script all over the walls of the ark, destroying his priceless photographic record of reggae, then going back over it and meticulously crossing out every example of certain combinations of letters. In mid-1979, his wife Pauline and their daughter left him. That was the final straw for Scratch. With the last tether to earth gone, surrounded by gangsters, out of his mind on substances and stress and convinced he was being stolen from and not giving any credit for his music, he trashed the Black Ark from top to bottom in late 1979. Then, in early 1980, he burned it to the ground. And so ended the Roots reggae movement, but it didn't end Lee Perry's career. While always indefatigably Lee Perry, he became primarily a performer, working with other producers including the Beastie Boys until 2014's Back to the Controls, where he started working again in his new top secret laboratory in which only he was allowed, which tragically and ever so slightly hilariously he accidentally burned down in 2015. He's 84 years old now. He lives in Switzerland. He's married to a lovely lady. And he's still recording, he's still mad as a bag full of bees, he's still dancing, he's still upsetting. In short, he's still Lee Perry. When you're ready. Oh, when I'm ready. All right. I was born ready. Ready is my middle name. I've forgotten what I'm going to say. <laughs>